happy to introduce myself. My name is Bettina von Kampen. I'm a physiotherapist. I work in Hamilton at St. Joseph's Hospital. And I am going to be presenting something. I just wanted to thank Karen very much for that talk. I, and I really hope that some of these cures that we're talking about gain some traction. Is it just the arrow key? Yeah, OK. So uh, the talk is on adapting the Tinetti scale for balance and gait for persons with dementia. And as a physiotherapist, part of my job on the, uh, in the hospital where I work for the seniors behavioral unit where we have a number of patients who are referred there for aggressive, responsive behaviors, part of my job is to assess their mobility. And so the uh, Professional Advisory Council at St. Joe's provides a little bit of funding for these kinds of initiatives. My colleague, Allison Douglas and I, um, kind of identified a bit of a gap when it comes to assessing these kinds of people with their, some of their limitations. So the biggest gap is that most of the assessment tools that are out there that have been validated in terms of having any meaning when you add up the score require a lot of following of directions which patients uh, and and people in the community as well with with a certain level of impairment just cannot do and in discussion with some colleagues at other hospitals what we found people were doing they were assessing patients using the Berg or using the Tinetti scale or, or whichever assessment tool they chose, but they would leave things out that the patient couldn't do. And so then when you add up the score and try to determine a falls risk, you really aren't able to interpret that score very well. So we thought we should possibly try to come up with something that would work with this population of patients. So we looked at the Tinetti scale and uh, just as an aside, Mary Tinetti did give her consent for us to modify this scale and to start trying to establish some reliability and validity for uh, a newly modified scale. So the Tinetti scale is a 17 item scale that uh, goes through balance and gait analysis and comes up with a score. And it also is predictive of falls. Um, Yeah, and the, re the reason we chose it is um, because a lot of the components are already based strictly on observation. And so we decided to make some modifications so that the whole thing was just based on observation so the patients would not have to actually follow any directions and then we didn't have to leave any items out. Um, it's also quite feasible to administer this scale in 10 minutes or less. It doesn't require a lot of training. Um, all of the items, there's a balance subscale and a gate subscale, and then you get a total score. Uh, I believe the original scale is out of 28, and a score of 19 indicates a falls risk, but you have to total up the two subscales to get that score. And it looks at things like rising from a chair, walking, and then you analyze the gate in terms of stride length, if it's equal or not, um, uh, uh, balance, in terms of can they turn around. There was a couple of things that we left out that I will get to. Uh, but basically, you're just watching the person walk, see if they can negotiate to sit down again, and if they deviate from that path. And, the, and these kinds of things are um, it's e easily available online if you want to look up the original scale. It's quite easy to use. The items are scored out of either 0, one or some of the items were out of two, and then you just add it up and, and get your score. The things that we chose to omit for this population were the standing with feet together and then nudging the person three times on the sternum to gauge their balance reactions. And uh, the reason for this was because, first of all, a lot of the, the people we work with don't like to be touched and also don't like to be pushed which could result in some responsive behavior. So we thought that would probably be a good one to leave out. So we took that one out and the standing with the eyes closed for 10 seconds. Also, we, the, the people we work with are, are quite impaired and they wouldn't understand that instruction. So we took that, uh, those, so those two items were removed altogether from the scale. And then 
And we modified one, which was turning 360 degrees. We did a more functional turn of just um, 180 degrees. And what we did there is we would just walk with the person to the end of a hallway, and then they would just naturally turn around and walk the other way. And that way we could assess um, how easily they did that. And the reason we're doing this study is because anytime you modify a scale, you need to reestablish reliability and validity. So, um, so far we have just looked at the reliability. We are planning on hopefully doing a prospective cohort study to establish the validity and um, some meaning behind that in terms of falls, risk, and that sort of thing. So we looked at inter-rater and test retest reliability of this modified scale. And we also tested it in two settings. We tested it on the inpatient unit where I work, and we also uh, tested it on the ALC unit at a downtown site of the same hospital. We did go to a long-term care facility, but we did run into some difficulty with recruitment, which uh, I'm, I'm sure you understand the difficulties in getting uh, consent from substitute decision makers. It's, it's, it's very difficult to, um, it's logistically it's possible of course, but it does seem to take a long time. So uh, we did end up with, oh, that's on another slide. Um, yeah, so we, test, uh, we tested inpatients and residents. The inclusion criteria uh, were basically they had to have a diagnosis of dementia and they needed to be able to ambulate with minimal assistance. Now we did include for this study, we did actually test some people that needed quite a lot of assistance, but because we were testing reliability, it was fine. To, and then people were excluded if there were any acute changes in their medical status, um, such as a delirium or an acute infection. And of course, we needed to get consent from the substitute decision maker for them to participate in the study. <clears throat> These are the other institutions that um, worked with us. We never did get to Parkwood, which is in London. It was just, it had to do with their ethics board. It was just taking too long and um, the timeline was drawing to a close, so we weren't able to go there. So we had two staff who read the instructions and practiced a couple of times and then um, administered the measure. That was for the inter-rater reliability. The test-retest reliability, um, we simply did that 10 to 30 minutes after the first administration of the, uh, of the test. We had 22 participants who consented, and then um, in the end we had 18 participants that we gathered valid data on. One person was not able to ambulate, and then there were three people who weren't available on the day that we were testing. Um, I've just included a little bit of the stats. The mean age was 77, the male-female breakdown, uh, the most common secondary diagnoses that we saw, diabetes, heart disease, and Parkinson's. And just to give you an idea of the level of impairment, those were the MMSE scores. That was the range of scores um, for these participants. And again, this is, this is just for reliability, so this slide is just for interest's sake. These are the scores that we got. It's uh, now a scale that's scored out of 25. And again, you can see there's quite a range there of scores and, and abilities. Some people scored perfectly, and uh, some scored quite poorly. Hmm. Oh. oh, I see, okay. Um, and there's the results. They look uh, pretty promising for reliability for this scale, and uh, we are hoping to move forward, as I said, to test the validity. And uh, these scores are also quite similar to the original uh, reliability scores for the Tenetti when they tested that, which uh, there you have it right there. And we definitely found that uh, it's, it's feasible to administer this scale in, in different settings, with also with different um, professionals able to quite easily follow the instructions and administer the test. Just a few points of discussion. Um, as I mentioned, the turning 180 degrees was quite easily accomplished. 
just by leading the person towards the end of the hallway. And then um, we had to observe the skill in which, with which they did that, which included how smoothly they moved, if the steps were continuous or if they stuttered a little bit. Um, there, there was significant issues sometimes with cueing patients. Even though everything is based on observation, we still had to get people to get up and come and walk with us. And then, and then we also had to have them sit down again. And then for the test, retest, it was sometimes difficult to convince them to get up again and come for another walk with us. We had one gentleman who had been a school principal and he could walk actually quite well, but for the most part he really didn't want to. So sometimes we would just tell him there was an assembly and we would start to sing the national anthem and that sometimes, <laughs> sometimes got him to his feet. Um, but you know, whatever, whatever works, right? Um, and then in terms of, uh, one of the items is whether or not they deviate from their path. Now, we found that a lot of the participants did deviate, but they were actually, it wasn't sort of a pathological kind of gait uh, deviation. They were just walking towards something else. And so we scored that accordingly. Um, another point is that I think the original scale requires an armless chair. That's how they want the participants to be assessed. But with uh, the people that we saw, if they were mostly in a wheelchair, we would just assess them from there. We didn't have them transfer. It's, I mean, it was so difficult to get going anyway. We didn't transfer them first to another chair and then take it from there. We would just use the chair that they were in. So the conclusions we can draw from this, uh, this early work is that the reliability of the modified measure is quite high. Um, the assessment of functional changes in this population is important for determining the impact of mobilization and least restraint policies for people with dementia. Falls prevention as well is something that we are always looking at, uh, not just on this unit and with this population, but throughout hospitals. And um, we are hoping to study this a bit further and um, establish validity and then hopefully be able to use this tool in a meaningful way with uh, this population. That's all I've got. Thank you so much.